My name is Mohamed Bakker. I am from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech, and I'll be making this presentation entitled Heterogeneous Integration, State-of-the-Art and Emerging Technologies. The outline for the talk is as follows. First, I'll begin with the introduction and summary of current state-of-the-art. Next, I'll describe our work in state chip technology for die-to-die -die connectivity, followed by self-alignment technologies for interposers and photonic chiplets. Next, I'll describe recent work in the area of 3D heterogeneous integration. Finally, concluding the presentation on the topic of cooling for 2.5D and 3D heterogeneous integration. In 1965, Gordon Moore published his famous paper entitled Cramming More Components onto Integrated Circuits. At the time, he projected that the number of transistors per unit area will double every year. This projection was revised in 1975 where he projected that the number of transistors will double every two years. That projection has held true for many, many decades, until recently where there appears to be another slowing of Moore's law. But for the purpose of this presentation, Gordon Moore also made another very important projection in that exact same paper of 1965. On the very last page of this paper, he notes the following. The total cost of making a particular system function must be minimized. And at some point, it may prove to be more economical to build large systems out of smaller functions, which are separately packaged and interconnected. This projection forms the basis for what is typically referred to today as heterogeneous integration using 2.5D and 3D technology. The projection of 1965 that Gordon Moore made was recently validated by uh, a study performed by Samsung, where they plot the cost-benefit analysis of large die at leading edge process technologies. The graph shows the relative cost defined as the cost of building a lot of, say, sub-circuit elements that are glued together at the package versus building the same, um, the, versus building a single large chip with all these sub-circuit elements. These sub-circuit elements are what we typically refer to as chiplets. What this graph shows is that beyond the 150 millimeter squared, there are cost benefits to taking a large monolithic silicon die and breaking it up into chiplets or sub-circuits and gluing these back at the package level. And what we see is that the cost benefit increases dramatically as the die size becomes larger and larger. A similar study was performed by AMD where they demonstrated that building a large uh, core processor using a chiplet architecture versus a single monolithic die is, is once again more advantage towards a chiplet-based architecture. So these results clearly validate the, the prediction that Gordon Moore made in 1965 on his very last page of his manuscript. The trend towards building systems out of chiplets is, is driven by a number of factors. Cost, as was shown in the previous slide, is certainly an important one. Another important factor is the fact that Digital RF and I.O. functions, for example, have very different requirements. For example, digital processes are optimized for density, leakage, and speed, whereas radio frequency integrated circuits perform better in processes that are optimized for passives, high voltages, and speed. And therefore, by decoupling RFICs, I.O., I.O. circuits and digital ICs allows for separate roadmaps and separate optimization of these 
different functions that can then be reintegrated back together as a pack. And as was noted previously, there has been recent trends where the historical density scaling that was projected in 1975 and the energy bill operation benefits that we have enjoyed for many decades have begun to slow beyond the seven nanometer technology. And so all these factors point to the trend towards taking a large monolithic die and breaking it up into chiplets. And so what that really lends results in is a complexity in the process of how you glue the chiplets back together. When you're looking at a monolithic process, adjacent IP blocks, for example, as shown here, communicate together using on-chip interface, using meaning the back end of the line. However, the moment we break up the IP blocks into chiplets, all communication occurs now through the package. And so in order to rebuild the electrical function, with the performance that's equivalent to what you would have with a monolithic chip, it's very important that one designs these off-chip interconnects in the right way. For digital applications, they have to be extremely high density and extremely short in length. And so this represents a fundamental challenge to historical packaging, in which historical packaging technologies were very much uh, pitch limited, meaning the pitches of interconnects are very large, and the distance between components was very large as well. As shown in this graph, historical packaging uh, typically would look something like this, where, for example, you have an FPGA onto a package that sits onto a motherboard that then communicates to a nearby DRAM chip using an, through another package substrate. In this case, the interconnect length is measured by inches, and the interconnect pitch at the printed circuit board is measured in the millimeter scale. Unfortunately, this packaging technology is simply not compatible with this chiplet architecture in which you need to have extremely high density, extremely short interconnects in order to rebuild the circuit function with a performance that's equivalent to what you might have at the monolithic. And because of this, over the last roughly 10 years, and certainly in the last five or so years, there has been uh, an explosion of very exciting new packaging technologies to overcome this challenge. These packaging technologies typically fall under a category called 2.5D integration or 3D integration. 2.5D integration simply means the chips are placed side by side with very small distance and at very high densities. There are many amazing um, examples of research that has been done in this area, for example, by Intel, iMac, IBM, AMD, and many, many others. On the 3D integration side, which means now you are stacking chiplets on top of each other, there are many wonderful examples in the industry from companies like TSMC, Global Foundry, Samsung, AMD, and Intel, and so on. But essentially what these two um, uh, vectors here represent is essentially a new phase of Moore's law as he projected. And what we notice is as we go from the left to the right, the energy efficiency of communication tends to improve, in this case, by more than 100x and here by more than 30x. So there's clearly a lot of benefits towards going to heterogeneous integration using these advanced technologies. In this slide, we break down a little bit the landscape um, in perhaps a little bit more finer grain. Within the 2.5D and 3D, with, excuse me, within the 2.5D or sometimes called 2D enhanced technologies, there are many different architectures. Some are based on high density, um, you know, organic type packages. 
Some are based on what we call fan out wafer level packaging. Some are based on interposer type technologies and some are based on brood chip technologies. In all of these cases, the objective is the same, high density interconnects and very tight integration of components. The way that uh, these are achieved is, is what makes these different technologies. So for example, in the interposer technology, the silicon interposer is basically a passive silicon die with simply the back end of the line interconnect. In the bridge chip technology, a silicon chiplet is embedded within the organic package to create the connection between neighboring dye. Some of the examples, uh, technologies that have been demonstrated by industry are shown here. Um, and those again include from AMD, TSMC, Amcor, for example, for some of the fan out and um, uh, multi-chip modules. On the interpose and bridge chip technologies, they include again examples from TSC, TSMC, Upsolix, which is manufacturing um, glass packages with very high densities, Intel with their EMIP technology, Samsung with their IQ, and many other examples. Further, these architectures uh, also involve 3D chip stacking, where the chips are stacked vertically, and there's again a number of exciting technologies being developed by industry in these areas. Further, 2.5D and 3D need not live in isolation. There are many, many technologies today and demonstrations and products that combine the best of 2.5D technologies with 3D technologies as shown, for example. To give further details of some of these examples from industry, I have a few slides that describe current state-of-the-art examples. Here is some work that was recently demonstrated by AMD where they stack um, SRAM on top of a logic die and connected using what we call through silicon vias. These through silicon vias are nothing more than essentially a silicon, um, uh, excuse me, a copper wire that goes through the silicon chip. That copper wire is shown with this, um, shown you in this SEM image, and that's what allows you to create vertical stacking. In this case, the pitch of the through silicon vias and the bonds is approximately nine microns, which is an incredibly aggressive um, dimensions by today's uh, state of the art. This is an example from Intel where they have taken four basically CPUs that have been glued together using the EMIP technology in which there is a little brick chip um, device placed within the organic package that creates high density connectivity between these four CPU chiplets that makes them behave as if they're almost monolithically integrated. This is an example from Global Foundries and ARM where they did face-to-face -face bonding of chiplets um, uh, using um, at pitches of approximately 5.7 micron. And in this case, this was done using wafer level processes. Here's an example from CA Letty where they basically stack chiplets on an interposer. But in this case, this interposer is actually active that and contains some circuit functions that were um, helpful to include the interposer for the system they were demonstrating. Uh, there are a number of examples of 3D technologies and 2.5D technologies from Samsung, including Samsung's X-Cube, Samsung iCube, and recently Samsung HBM PIM system. There are several examples of 2.5D and 3D technologies being developed by Intel. This is an example shown here from um, uh, this reference, which is a, this is a Lakefield processor in which we have um, a 10 nanometer compute die placed on top of a 22 uh, nanometer base die. This is using the Fivorous platform and the density of the connections between the two stacked components is approximately 50 microns. More recently, Intel demonstrated the Intel Pontivecu in which they demonstrated 47 active die bonded onto an package that combines two technologies. The first 
is 3D stacking of some of the active circuitry onto a base tile die. And then that base tile die is connected to a, another base tile die using the EMIP technology. And so this is an example of an incredibly aggressive and sophisticated uh, demonstration using twin IFD. With respect to RF and millimeter wave applications, there are also many exciting examples of advanced packaging technologies that have been used to address some important uh, need areas. In this slide, we show several examples, for example, from IBM, Intel, and Samsung, in which they use advanced packaging to integrate an array of radiating elements on one side of the package and place active circuitry that controls these radiating elements on the other side of the package. More recent demonstrations of heterogeneous integration for RF and millimeter wave applications show even more aggressive uh, packaging technologies and concepts. For example, here we show um, an example packaging technology developed by METSMC where the RF ICs are actually embedded into the package using um, uh, using the fan out wave level process and radiating elements are placed in very close proximity to the RFIC. Similar uh, uh, concepts and approaches were developed by others, for example, by Infineon. And more recently, HRL demonstrated a concept where RFICs are actually embedded within a layer of copper, the copper being there to help spread the heat uh, much more maybe favorably than some of the other fanat wave packaging technologies. And advanced interconnect structures are used to connect the neighboring dye. In the next set of slides, I will be presenting some of our work at Georgia Tech in the area of advanced packaging and heterogeneous integration. As in the case in typical electronic systems, one needs a variety of chip technologies sourced from different semiconductor technologies. For a typical front end RF millimeter wave system, the LNA, PA, and switch can be made out of gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, and indium phosphide technologies. DSP logic control memory are metro silicon processes and ADCs and DACs can be made out of indium phosphides, HBT, depending on, of course, applications. Further, a typical need in these systems is the need for low loss and low parasitic off-chip interconnects with very tight impedance control. To understand this point, it's, a, it's, it's relevant to look at how typical RFICs are packaged today and interconnect. There are basically three main uh, ways of doing it. One is based on wire bonding, the other is based on flip chip bonding, and the other is based on additive manufacture. Wire bonding, of course, the benefit there and what makes it very attractive is the simplicity. It's a very mature technology. However, it can do, ha, create very high inductance values, creates impedance discontinuity, can be a source of radiation loss, and is very narrow band. Um, one way to overcome this is use flip chip technology, which is a technology that has many, many positive attributes, but can also be potentially problematic, depending on applications, uh, as they can lead to substrate coupling and substrate detuning. It can induce reworkability challenges because in some cases you need to underfill these systems and that can be, again, introduce several challenges. Additive manufacturing, there are many uh, you know, amazing examples in the literature about using additive manufacturing to create interconnects. However, this technology still is not fully mature. Um, it, the ability to precisely control feature dimensions in additive manufacturing can be a source of impedance mismatches and discontinuities. And so to overcome some of these challenges, we have proposed the, me the method shown here, in which we use what we call a stitch chip to interconnect neighboring dye and to connect a dye to the package. 
A stitch chip in the simplest form is basically made out of a low lost fused silica substrate with low loss interconnects. Further, on this stitch chip, we form what we call compressible micro interconnects or CMIs. These compressible micro interconnects enable you to connect two neighboring die irrespective of any height mismatches between them. The anatomy of a stitch chip is shown here. Once again, in the simplest case, it's basically a chiplet that's made out of a few silica. The chiplet contains transmission lines that are very carefully controlled and designed. And at the tail end of these transmission lines, we form these compressible micro interconnects, which are shown in this optical image. These compressible micro interconnects are a mechanical, uh, essentially a mechanical spring that can also be used to provide a path for, for electrical conduction. When you apply mechanical force on top of these compressible micro interconnects, these interconnects mechanically deform. And so in this example, these interconnects can deform by approximately 30 micron with a force of approximately 2.5 millimeter. Here we show images of these compressible micro interconnects where um, we, we show that the smallest inline pitch we have created is 20 micron. The largest height we've created is approximately 80 microns tall. And these interconnects are all wafer level batch fabricated. And their core is made out of nickel tungsten, which is a material that we use to optimize the mechanical properties. Further, these interconnects are coated with electrolyzed gold. And the reason we use electrolyzed gold is because it helps us prevent oxidation of the nickel tungsten as well as helps to reduce the resistance of the interconnects. Here we show the characterization of the compressible micro interconnects where with the loss of the compressible micro interconnect is shown to be less than 0.2 dB at 30 gigahertz. And so the elect despite the shape of these compressible micro interconnects, despite the fact they're made out of the nickel tungsten core with the gold coating, they demonstrate a very low insertion. In order to demonstrate the electrical benefits of the stitch chip technology compared to wire bond, we designed and fabricated two test beds in which we um, essentially came up uh, with an architecture where we can probe um, two transmission lines that are connected with a wire bond and compare that same transmission line when it's connecting using a stitch chip. And the results are shown here in which the insertion loss of the two transmission lines com connected with wire bond shows a loss of approximately 5 dB at 50 gigahertz, whereas in our case, the loss is sub 1 dB at 50 gigahertz. And in this table, what we demonstrate is sort of the comparison of stitch chip technology, its metrics and performance compared to some of the other technologies that have been demonstrated um, in this field. And this table is really left for the audience member to look at in more detail. In a recent paper that is soon to be published, we demonstrate the integration of our stitch chip technology with an LNA and compare that performance with the BioWare bond technology. And what we demonstrate are significant improvements in LNA performance as a result of using the stitch chip technology. The details of this will be presented in ECTC 2023. In the next section, I describe our work in self-alignment of bridge chip and interposer technology. So a typical interposer system is shown here in which you have, for example, stacked memory adjacent to a CMOS die on top of an interposer that's then mounted on an organic package and then subsequently to the motherboard. 
one of the things that we have been looking at is to really eliminate the pack organic package and assemble the interposers directly onto a motherboard. In this case, we use our compressible micro interconnects. Specifically, we use another version of the compressible micro interconnects, which we call um, mechanically flexible interconnects or MFI, mechanically flexible interconnects. Further, what we demonstrate and develop is a method in which you can passively uh, self-align interposer to the motherboard. In this case, we built semispherical structures made out of photoresist on the motherboard and build the inverse pyramid structures into the silicon substrate. And by placing the interposer directly into the motherboard, these two structures, the inverse pyramid structure, as well as the semispherical structure, precisely self-align with each other. Further, what we are really interested in doing is building a larger scale contiguous silicon system in which we, for example, assemble two neighboring interposers directly onto the motherboard using our self-alignment structures and these mechanically flexible interconnects. And in order to avoid the low density interconnects in the motherboard, we create a silicon brit chip where that silicon brit chip creates very high density interconnects between neighboring interposers. And so the benefit of this technology is that you can extend the benefits of high density interconnects from one interposer to the other. And so compared to going versus to the motherboard, this technology offers a 300x improvement in the density of IO between one interposer to the other. We have also looked at building photonic interconnects across these bird chips to enable connection across a large scale silicon system. But here what we demonstrate is the actual fabrication assembly of three interposers directly into the, F, into the FR4 motherboard using our self-alignment structures. And so here we show three neighboring silicon interposers, one, two, and three. Next, we integrate the brick chip technology in which is shown here. And so the idea is we now create brick chip one, brick chip two, as shown here, to electrically couple to a neighboring die. And so now what we have is basically a silicon interposer system that is six centimeter by two centimeter. And therefore, we have a large scale contiguous silicon interposer system that allows you to integrate a large functionality across this without having to go through the motherboard for electrical connectivity. If you look very closely at this image, you see these little tiny dots at the corner of the screen of the image. These tiny dots are these semispherical structures that we make on the FR4. And if you look very carefully, there's a tiny square structure that is in the center here. And this represents the inverse pyramid structure that is used to self-align the brick chip to the silicon interposer. And more recently, we have been using this self-alignment technology to self-align a large array of optical fibers for an underlying silicon photonic chip. And for the purposes of time, I will skip the details and encourage the, 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 the audience members to look at the uh, references that we have at the end of this presentation. So the next set of slides, I would like to talk about some of our work in 3D heterogeneous integration. So today, there are really two camps in 3D heterogeneous integration. One camp is focused in the area of what we call monolithic 3D. Monolithic 3D simply means wafer scale 3D integration. And what that really specifically means is that um, you build transistor layers or device layers um, sequentially at the wafer level. 
The benefits of monolithic 3D is that it offers extreme density and very high bandwidth density between layers because it's all a monolithic process. It has extreme energy efficiency. However, because it is a monolithic process, the type of materials and devices you can integrate into this stack are very limited. The fabrication cycle times are very complex and can be very, very lengthy. And this is a pure foundry play and the cost is very high because this is once again a monolithic process where things are built sequentially at the wafer level. On the other end, we have what we call heterogeneous integration 3D technologies. Um, these, you know, certainly include wafer to wafer bonding, uh, chip to chip bonding, chip to wafer bonding, and even some interposer type technologies. The main attractiveness to these technologies is that they allow you to have a very high flexibility in materials and devices. So for example, uh, I can easily take two different chips and put them together without any worry about uh, whether they're materially compatible with each other because you're not doing this in a foundry process. The design cycles are much shorter here However, these technologies tend to be much more limited in terms of what kind of I.O. densities you can achieve. This is particularly important for digital applications. And so there's really an opportunity in which one can overcome this gap between high density monolithic 3D, yet limited flexibility, or high flexibility heterogeneous 3D, with low density connectivity by developing new packaging concepts. And so what we want to do is really combine the best of the two worlds. And so one technology that we're pursuing here is showing you where the idea is you begin with a silicon wafer, followed by some monolithic-like processes where it makes sense and it's economically viable and technologically viable. But for things that are simply not compatible with the foundry process, those can be heterogeneously integrated. So here we show examples in which thin chiplets can be heterogeneously integrated in the back end. Um, in order to enable this vision, there are many, many complexities and many challenges that need to, to be overcome. One of which is really how do you create high density connections between these embedded chiplets and the back end of the line. And so there what we will discuss in the next few slides is the method in which we can use gas phase deposition to create bonding. But before I describe that work, uh, one of the things we would also need in this vision, very high density through silicon vias, through these chiplets that are being, for example, integrated within the back end. So here we show examples in which we've made through silicon vias that are about 110 nanometer diameter and two micron tall. So the process that we have been developing here in collaboration with our colleagues in um, UC San Diego and Wayne State University is to take an array of chiplets, mount them directly onto a wafer, and then insert that wafer with the array of chiplets into an ALD chamber where using the right chemistry and the right process, uh, we can grow cobalt interconnect in between the two facing surfaces. So the top chip with this top, top um, copper pad and the bottom chip with this bottom copper pad. By passing in the right gases, these gases can decompose selectively only on the copper region. And when they selectively decompose, they leave behind cobalt atoms that build up during the process. And as they build up, they end up producing an interconnect layer. So this is a process that does not utilize any thermomechanical forces and requires low temperature processes of 200 C. Here we show sort of a cartoon sketch of how the copper pads would look like when they're facing each other before bonding in the ALD chamber in here after the ALD chamber. 
Here are some SEM images that show a top copper pad uh, placed above a bottom copper pad in which initially there's an air gap in between and the air gap is subsequently filled using this ALD process of cobalt selective deposition where the air gap has been now replaced with cobalt integration. Further, in another 3D heterogeneous integration technology, we have been looking at building reconstituted wafers using silicon dioxide, where the basic idea is you take an array of chiplets, you encapsulate these chiplets using silicon dioxide. Once you can play them with silicon dioxide, you can build through oxide vias and RDL, and then stack these reconstituted silicon dioxide with the chiplets. The benefits of this are numerous, including much higher density connections, low temperature processes, allows you to do uh, wafer to wafer uh, bonding using these reconstituted processes, which subsequently have its own benefits, both from economics and from a density point of view. But to dig a little bit deeper, I wanted to really compare the process that we just described in the previous slide to what is typically referred to as fan out wafer level packaging. In fan out wafer level packaging, um, typically you have a series of chiplets, for example, here represented by the red and the blue um, rectangles that are encapsulated in an epoxy uh, molding compound. Once you're encapsulated, typically you have to go through a curing process. However, when you go through the curing process, this epoxy molding, molding compound undergoes a shrinkage. That shrinkage causes the dye to shift, and that can introduce some challenges into the alignment between the dye. Further, these um, phenotypical packaging processes made out of these epoxy-based materials tend to be fairly thick. The via dimensions through these layers tend to be fairly large. And so that really limits the IO density that you can attain vertically. But comparison by the technology that we are developing, we're encapsulating these chiplets using essentially a silicon process. We're depositing silicon dioxide using IPC, uh, ICP PCBD process. This is a low deposition temperature process of sub 200 degrees. It leads to very thin reconstituted layers. It minimizes CT mismatch because the silicon dioxide and the chiplets are much closer in CT compared to the molding compound and the chiplets. This process requires no curing, and this really provides you an opportunity to have much higher density VS and RDL compared to the molding compound. Further, what this allows you to do, instead of doing, for example, dye to wafer bonding, which is a serial process, and that tends to be very limited um, relatively limited alignment, particularly for digital applications. Once you, re you reconstitute a, a, a silicon dioxide wafer with a sea of chiplets, you can now use wafer-to-wafer -wafer bonding processes to create the bonding. And here we show an image in which we have some chiplets that have been embedded within the silicon dioxide reconstituted layer. So this outline that I am drawing here with my laser pointer represents a silicon dioxide layer that has been um, uh, used to encapsulate this sea of chiplets. These chiplets can range anywhere from 10 by 10 microns to um, something on the order of 1 by 1 millimeter. Further, here we show a copper through oxide via made through silicon dioxide. And in this case, the diameter is about approximately 5 microns. But for some digital applications, this needs to be even further smaller, and that is something we have been looking for. Further, in order to mitigate heat spreading, we have integrated copper heat spreader that are monolithically fabricated onto these SIO2 reconstituted chiplets, as shown here, and have demonstrated thermal benefits that come from this copper heat spreader technology. So the last thing I would like to discuss in this presentation is the area of cooling for 2.5D and 3D technology. So as was stated in the introduction, 2.5D and 3D have many, many benefits from an electrical point of view. Uh, shorter interconnects, denser interconnects, these all, all lead 
to more energy efficient digital systems. Further, for RF and millimeter wave uh, impedance control and loss between a neighboring chiplets can be significantly reduced when they're integrated using twin IFD and 3D architecture. However, a fundamental challenge that comes from such dense integration is thermal. Thermal challenges include number one, the increased power density in packages because you have more components, there's more power being dissipated. And so the power load, the power dissipation in the package can be very, very large, depending on applications. The other challenge that occurs is actually thermal crosstalk. Whether it's 2.5D or 3D, uh, you know, a die that has very high power density can easily cause a neighboring die with low power density to heat up, simply because they are in very close proximity. This close proximity effect of thermal coupling becomes even more problematic when you start stacking chips vertically. And so here we show an image in which, for example, as a CPU uh, temperature is changing based on workload, and as a CPU gets very hot, for example, the memory die heats up. Here we show uh, uh, a steady state result in which the processor had a very high power density, and because the processor had very high power density, it had further high junction temperatures, but because it's directly attached to the memory die underneath it, the thermal map that is generated in the processor is essentially duplicated in the memory, despite the memory die being of a low power die. And so thermal coupling is another challenge. And so the question is, how do you overcome thermal coupling into an IFD? Well, one option is to make the distance between chiplets longer. Unfortunately, that is not doable for a number of reasons. One, while yes, increasing the junction, uh, excuse me, the length uh, separation between neighboring die causes the temperature to reduce in the die, the low power die, that unfortunately is a penalty for that, which is an increase in the energy consumption and an increase in the delay that is associated with the increased interconnect length. And so to overcome thermal problems, one really needs to invent and develop thermal solutions that are co-integrated within 2.5D and 3D technologies. And so the, to this end, one of the things that we have been looking at is the idea of embedding liquid cooling in 3D chipsets, as well as in 2.5D architecture. The basic idea is that if we can build little miniature microscale liquid channels in the active die, then we can pump liquid across the active die that are stacked, while at the same time creating electrical connection between the stacked chiplets using these through silicon beams. And so the basic idea is that you can potentially etch the backside of the chip to build these silicon cylindrical structures. And with these silicon cylinders, you can integrate through silicon vias. These through silicon vias would be used to enable um, die to die communication and power delivery for the stack components. And when liquid is pumped across the silicon cylinders, the interaction between the fluid and these solid structures results in heat removal from the chiplets. There are several challenges to integrating this microfluidic cooling solution in a 3D chip, 3D chip stack. One of which is really due to the requirements of thermal resistance and pressure drop. In general, microfluidic cooling solutions tend to be preferred to be tall in scale because of making the cooling solution large in scale increases the surface area and increasing the surface area leads to reduce thermal resistance and reduce pressure drop. However, when you make these cooling solutions long in, in size, that also means you're making the through silicon via that has to go through that cooling solution uh, tall in size. And so long story short is that 
if you have a low aspect ratio through silicon via technology, and in this case, aspect ratio refers to the height to diameter ratio for through silicon via. For low aspect ratio through silicon vias, as I increase my pin fin height, for example, to improve my thermal performance, you pay a significant penalty. And that penalty is that now you end up with much larger diameter vias, which are lower density, they're larger capacitance, uh, they are um, uh, have a larger latency and have unfavorable energy per bit and bandwidth density metrics. By contrast, if somebody can develop an as uh, through silicon via technology in which the aspect ratio is very very high then as you go from pin fin design one to pin fin two you can improve the thermal performance because it's taller more surface area to remove the heat but because of the higher aspect ratio through silicon vias you're able to maintain the density of the interface of course certainly you're paying you know a larger price for inductance, resistance, and capacitance because the interconnects are longer. However, these are um, still advantage to, to some of the metrics over here, particularly in the capacitance. To, to dig a little bit more deep, on this topic here, we show a plot showing the thermal resistance of a micro pin fin heat sink versus height. And as the height of the pin fin heat sink increases, the resistance drop reduces. However, what we also show is that as a function of the aspect ratio of the sil through silicon via, the TSV capacitance can be reduced significantly as we go from, let's say, 10 to 1 aspect ratio uh, to up to 30 to 1 aspect ratio where the capacitance value can reduce significantly. Here we show a plot where we show um, the number of TSVs as a function of pin fin height for different aspect ratio technologies. And what we show again is that as the aspect ratio with the TSV technology increases, so does the number of TSVs. Here we show several examples of um, micro pin fin heat sinks that have made with through silicon vias. Um, here we show, uh, you know, mo much more slender pin fin structures, which is the heat sink with a very tiny dot in the center. That tiny dot in the center is actually a copper through silicon vias. Here we show them at different dimensions. And the reason you want to explore the dimension of these pin fins is, is because that impacts essentially the total surface area available, which then impacts the thermal resistance and the pressure drop in the system. Further, we have designed these systems, uh, microfluidic heat sinks, which to have an array of through silicon vias as shown in this image, or in this case, we have a four by four array of through silicon vias made in the microfluidic heat sink. Uh, we have done extensive modeling and measurement of TSVs within the microfluidic casing. And what we have shown is that the losses of the through silicon vias up to 50 gigahertz can be very, very large since the DI water, which is used to, in the cooling, tends to have a very really, um, poor electrical properties, which leads to very high losses of the interconnects. So one way to circumvent that problem is to build coax type through silicon vias, where the idea is you have a center conductor that is used for signaling and it's surrounded by multiple ground vias. And by doing so, and as we show in our publications, you can essentially shield the signal interconnect from the working fluid, which again can have very poor electrical dielectric properties. When it comes to demonstrating the benefits of liquid cooling, we have recently demonstrated um, those benefits onto our actual working prototype. In this case, it's a 2.5D test bed in which we have a center FPGA surrounded by four transceiver die. Uh, what we did essentially is we etched these silicon pin fins directly on the back side of the FPGA and the transceiver die and attached fluidic inlet outlet 
course to each of the chiplets shown below. And the key takeaway from this is that when you do this monolithic liquid cooling compared to in one of the most aggressive air cooled heat sinks we can find, we can reduce the junction temperature from 0.44 C to about 0.074 C. Further, we can reduce the thermal cross up between neighboring and die from 0.48 C per watt to about 0.042 C per watt. Intrusions integration play a critical role in future electronic systems. We have clearly entered a new era of Moore's law one that's driven by chiplet-based architectures and technologies. This new era of Moore's law was actually in large predicted by Gordon Moore himself once again in his 1965 paper. This chiplet-driven architectures are going to impact digital millimeter wave and photonic applications. And today we see there are many, many applications and technology demonstrations to and have the N3D technologies. Uh, in 2.5D, these include interposer, bridge chip, and finite wave load packaging technologies. 3D includes die to die, die to wafer, and two wafer to wafer bonding technologies. Um, the goal in some of these applications, especially digital size, is to blur the boundary between what's on chip and off chip interconnects. For RF and millimeter wave application driving forces, there are certainly form factor, impedance control, insertion laws, among others. While there have been many success stories in 2.5D 3D, I think the future is very bright for this area. I would say we're in the very early stage in this um, tech, uh, in this domain, in this new era of Moore's law, and there are some a number of exciting opportunities ahead of us. One of which includes, for example, how do you do efficient thermal management when you have such high density interconnect and integration. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the many sponsors to my lab that include uh, Jump 2.0 Centers, Cognizance and Chimes, Air Force Research Labs, NSF, GRC through SRC, uh, Georgia Research Corporation, NIH, and some of our other industry partners. Last but not least, we have included all the references that have been used in the slides at the end of this presentation. The introduction references are listed in these two um, slides shown here. This is number one, this is number two, and the references for the other sections are shown in this slide and the later slide. So with that, I would thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. Thank you again.